Welcome to this edition of Supply Chain Spotlight. I'm JT Anction with FreightWaves. Here with me is a special guest, Jim Blazer, Director at Alex Partners. Today, we're going to be talking about disruption in the supply chain. Jim, it's good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us, JT. I appreciate it so much. And where are you taking this call from today? I'm in my home office in New York. Okay. Uh, so. Has there been much traveling in, in, in your world, in your arena over the past sort of year or so? So for the last year, I've largely been working from here. Um, we have you know, some travel restrictions like most other firms. We do have uh, some team members traveling for specific jobs that require sort of shop floor manufacturing and the like. But uh, most of us have been working from home. Okay. And, and I ask because I know you, like myself, in, in, in previous uh, worlds, if you will, have been road warriors. So it's always interesting to see how those... Uh, standard practices evolve, and I myself have spent a lot less time on the road than I had previously, and so it's it's great that we're both able to be productive remotely. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely some some uh, puts and takes related to it, right? I mean, I get probably 20% of my week back for not leaving, but uh, you also sort of lack some of the face-to-face -face connections that you make. So I, I think that you know the best is to come in terms of a hybrid approach going forward, and we're looking forward to that. No, I think that's right. I think that's right. And so within that context, you know, let's talk a little bit about what the last year had brought to the space, both in the first, middle and last mile. And obviously, 2020 was a very unique year. And the puts and takes across all of those, you know, three market segments have been unique. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you'd seen from being on the front lines in the market? Yeah, it's, it's interesting that the front lines happen in my house now, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, uh, you know the last year or two, uh, so within Alex Partners, uh, I focus mainly on transportation, logistics, infrastructure. Um, I do that you know also within the the lens of our operations community, I focus on shipper side logistics, manufacturers, retailers, wholesalers. Um, but in the last two years of what we were talking about before, really focused on working with three PLs, trucking companies, ports, carriers of different sizes, shapes. Uh, and it's been it's been a good run for our, our transportation infrastructure practice. Um, you know what I, what I think is interesting is you know spending 2020 across those uh, those segments got a good real view around um, some of the disruption and obviously you know a, a buzzword that we're we're capturing here. Um, but I think you know certainly if there ever was a year that it was true, it was 2020. Um, and uh, you know we, and I think we we set out here to talk about you know first mile, last mile. Uh, and sort of everything in between, so a pretty ambitious scope. Um, but I, you know, I've been fortunate in the last year, uh, as I say, to, to sort of see some unique situations around. You know, first mile, if you want to start there and sort of go through our our look back, right? Um, you know, I, it, prior to COVID, prior to you know the pandemic, uh, you know, all eyes were on labor, labor availability, labor costs. But more than anything, it was it was sort of can I get people in my plant or in my DC? To do this work that needs to be done. Um, and I think there were a lot of programs that we were running and a lot of our clients were thinking about that through the lens of, you know, I can make everything I sell. How do I make more? Uh, what do I do in terms of strategies to get more people in the, in the warehouse or in the plant when I need them uh, and not necessarily have them when I don't, right? And so, you know, come COVID, the, I think the game changed a bit in terms of what we were optimizing for um, we were just trying to figure out how to keep the plant in DC running, you know, how to keep it staffed, how to be safe, how to keep people at distance in environments where they typically weren't designed to be at distance. So some unique challenges, how to do work remotely in an environment that is very uniquely sort of, a, you know, in the present, on the floor, so to speak, sort of environment um, was, was really challenging. Um, and, and so we saw the criteria change a bit from how do I get more people to how do I get people, period, keep them safe, get them there. Um, you know, I think that there's there was obviously a lot of disruption in, in that area, uh, and it manifests itself in terms of supply continuity, right? I mean, we saw at the outset of the pandemic, you know, the Chinese factory shut down for weeks, and we thought, well, that was dramatic, and then, you know, it landed on our shores, and we had all sorts of issues in terms of, you know, plants remaining open, avoiding outbreaks, those that did, how do we monitor them and mitigate them? Um, and we've seen, you know, all sorts of supply shocks throughout the network whether it's related to things that are just closer to the pandemic, like PPE, or just raw materials, you know, thinking about, you know, building materials and lumber. I mean, there's just so many products that, you know, at, at the base level that create freight demand at, that have been so volatile and, and disrupted, for lack of a better term, in the last year, right? So I, I think it was, you know, certainly a wild year, and that's not news to anybody, but I think we had a unique opportunity to work with companies in terms of 
helping them sort of reestablish a, a new normal of how they're operating and, and maintaining their, their supply output or, or distribution output. Um, and I see some interesting things when we look next year. So we'll, we'll save that for the look forward portion of it. So. Absolutely. And, 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 and I think that's a great backdrop to what has materialized over the past 12 months. You know, I, I want to say the last time we saw each other face to face, and obviously we've spoken um, virtually and over the phone between now and then, but I, th I think the last time we saw each other face to face was last February in Miami. And that was just before um, the big materialization of the, the pandemic. And, you know, interestingly, uh, you know, we, we had dinner on the back lawn um, at a conference down there. And the day after, I gave a speech to uh, a cohort of executives at an M&A conference and gave a breakdown of, uh, you know, the news we were hearing from Asia, <clears throat> plus some of the real-time data feeds we were seeing in international shipping, which were showing container vessel um, shipments down 40, 50, 60 percent year over year. And a component of the discussion I was giving was, you know, it's not really clear what this will materialize into, but it's very clear if just looking through transportation data that something really is coming to our shores. And there were some uh, of the executives I surveyed at that time, uh, many recognized that volumes may or may not be down, but they hadn't seen it domestically yet. There wasn't necessarily a large preparation effort at the time. And again, again, this is mid-February, um, and we all sort of left that conference uh, optimistic about what 2020 would look like. And lo and behold, within a, a month of that that speech, there was some material bullwhip uh, effects going through the supply chain uh, at a pretty rapid velocity. And so, when you think about the impacts of that across all elements. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very significant event, and it's interesting to hear you bring up labor uh, across a lot of the different sub-segments in transportation. You mentioned DCs and warehousing. The other, <clears throat> the other contrast of the the labor segmentation when you talk about you know in a, in a pandemic event relates to you know driver supply, right? You know because you think DCs and warehousing you have a lot of people in a confined four four wall areas. In contrast, you know your drivers are by themselves in the cab, right? And so uh, you know, from uh, within your your 14 hour HOS window, perhaps less interpersonal interaction, but it also meant that driver schools were shut down for a significant period of time, and so that capacity on the road was also um, pretty volatile, we'll say. Uh, you know, short haul and some DC mixes um, uh, served okay. The long haul market was pretty challenged, which was also stacked on top of. Um, federal stimulus checks going to a lot of drivers, which gave them a trade-off decision as to whether or not it would be a good time to take a vacation. So I think starting with labor is a great, great uh, way to talk about it, given the nature of the event. Yeah. And you also, you mentioned the bullwhip effect, and it's a great segue to the, the next topic I want to touch on, you know, ocean freight, you know, that, um, and, and just, you know, I failed to mention at the outset, I feel like this is sort of a homecoming. Just a shout out? From, yeah, prior to joining Alex Partners, I used to publish American Shipper, which is now part of FreightWave. So that's right. Uh, we know very well. This is a uh, uh, one of 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 you know probably a hundred or so webcasts. You guys have obviously grown a lot. You know, come a long way since uh, 2012 when I was there. But uh, you know, so we'll you know, put you the, on the alumni roster, the formal alumni roster. Yeah, well, we can talk about this later. I took an alumni picture at the last FreightWaves conference, but. Uh, yeah, so so uh, uh, you know, ocean freight, you know, which was really the the sort of crux of American Chipper, uh, and something I focused a lot of my career on. Uh, you really suffered from the bullwhip effect that you just mentioned, right? I mean, you have all this disruption in terms of freight generation and freight demand earlier in the year, and all the dislocation of vessels due to you know COVID issues, due to just this the ocean carriers scrambling to to sort of curtail supply uh, and reining costs. And then this massive sort of demand surge at the end of the year as, you know, people are starting to want to get back to normalcy or take their dollars as a consumer. And instead of going on vacation, they're re redoing a patio or, you know, buying new furniture or whatever the case is. And so, you know, what we saw in the back half of the year, just to be maybe more current, was, you know, a massive dislocation of, of ocean shipping capacity and demand uh, that's culminated into a very sort of timely and, you know, in the now uh, moment around you know port congestion, uh, sky high rates, real sort of disruption in the in the ocean supply chain. Uh, you know what I would call sort of the middle mile to pair up with your example of the, the trucking space. So really, uh, you know, all things are related, right? There's a butterfly effect here, or you know, I guess you used a more 
more scientifically the bullwhip effect, which I think is a bit more accurate. Um, and, and you bring up, uh, you, you mentioned uh, another big element of the middle mile, the, the mix shifting effect as a result of, 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 you know, the events that matriculated over the past year. <clears throat> you talked about people purchasing uh, uh, either new goods for their homes, whether it's a bigger couch or a more comfortable chair or purchasing a pool or buying new golf clubs because they wanted to have outdoor activities or outright purchasing a new home. Um, and a lot of that parlayed into what we saw as a significant mix shift to higher goods in relation to goods plus services of overall spending. And so from a transportation point of view, those goods are typically bigger and bulkier, right? They require more capacity, they're heavier. Um, and, and that economically uh, actually played out pretty well for the domestic surface transportation space. It'll be interesting to see in 2021 how that mix, whether it reverts back to the mean, whether it whether it, uh, uh, you know, weighted average, you know, shifts services a little bit higher than, than goods this year as it in relation to overall historical averages and what that means for overall surface transportation capacity. Demand. Yeah, and that's the even better segue than the last one into the next thing I want to talk about in the last mile, you know, is, is the sort of uh, introduction or some broadening of the category base of goods that are, that are home delivered, right? When we've been tracking the big and bulky space for years, um, and it's interesting. I, I did a uh, teleconference with your 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 friends and mine at Stiefel earlier last year um, on the the big and bulky space, uh, and we compared notes over all the like the odd objects that everybody bought at the beginning of the quarantine. And how many people went out and bought? I mean, they bought a trampoline, right? You know, how many people you know a new piano or a hot tub or you know? There's obviously large items that are that are sort of being bought with a greater frequency and. And consumers were looking for them to be delivered, installed, and you know managed to the you know, to the extent it was possible, given uh, you know COVID restrictions and people being in your home. Obviously, a little bit different wrinkle. Um, but one thing that I thought was interesting that we also saw in the last mile was you know consumers that were really focused on speed and cost were now focused on availability and capacity. Right? I, I don't know if you had the phenomenon of spending any sort of late nights trying to book a Peapod reservation, but I know, I know my parents did. For, for those who are listening at home, you know, the Peapod reservations become available at 1 a.m. And so if you want to get on the list, you got to be there with your shopping cart ready to click at 101, right? And so, you know, you saw a shift in terms of uh, consumers needed to have product delivered. They probably never would have had delivered before. Those who really wouldn't have had grocery delivery needed to have it. Those who wouldn't have had, you know, a big and bulky item delivered didn't have a choice. And we also saw a lot of interest in new areas like healthcare. Uh, you know, the telemedicine really bringing about greater delivery of uh, medical devices, medical products. Um, something I came to learn through the process was that just about every pharmacy in the country, uh, if they didn't already offer home delivery, now does. Um, be it a mom and pop or a local or or your you know your major chains. And so there's a huge entrance of of new players into the last mile. I think one thing we saw last year due to all of the concern over availability and the, the focus on getting your product was an increase in, in cost of last mile delivery as you know the, the resources capacity became tight and demand increased. Um, something I want to talk about as we sort of look forward, right? You know, what does that mean next year? Because I think that there's a lot to come in this space. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that's a phenomenal overview of what's materialized over the past 12 months or so. You know, um, I, I was speaking with an executive uh, at a large enterprise asset-based operation that also has asset light operations, but backed by assets. And they had done a file mile purchase um, within the six months before, um, you know, COVID had occurred. And the financials of that operation, thanks to volume and rate, had really significantly improved uh, over the COVID period because of all the demand. And then the pricing leverage they had and the increase in asset utilization, it was really tremendous. And I think that's true for a lot of final mile operators. And I think there's a really significant long-term secular trend where final mile operations, while they had been very attractive and, and desirable assets across the transportation space, have, have almost taken another step up above and beyond the, the desirability that, I, that had been seen before. And, and leading into those final mile networks, as, as we had talk, talked about, as much volatility as had occurred in the in the you know medium to long haul you know trucking space, um, sometimes that variation that volatility can be uh, good overall for the contract market because at times it'll push the spot market through contract rates, 
right? And then you tie it all the way to the ports, as, as you mentioned, as you know oh so well. Um, you know, the changes in capacity on, on the ocean not only impact rates on the ocean, but also for air freight forwarding if, if entities are looking for alternative methodologies for shipping goods. And so it creates a really unique year, which sets us up for an interesting thought exercise for <laughs> what, what the next year looks like, right? Yeah, it's amazing to me that you think that, you know, some, how many people talked about 2020 being a dumpster fire or whatever else the, the terms were, but it, just changing the calendar over doesn't change the reality of, of what the market we're in or the sort of the world we're in. So I think, you know, things are, they are, are improving in a lot of regards, but there's a lot of work to do. Um, you know, one of the things, I, you know, we want to track back over sort of our first mile, middle mile, last mile theme, um, if I may, you know, just sort of looking forward to this year, if that's, that's where we're going. Um, I think this story this year on the first mile is going to be all about technology. I, there were some things I saw last year in just sort of client cases uh, that we worked on either within logistics players or within the, the shippers and, and uh, you know, manufacturers, retailers, et cetera, um, that, you know, I, I see a, a larger a, adoption of, of technology that allows us sort of get at the heart of the issue around labor. Um, I, I've seen so much progress in the last few years. And, and so much sort of mind shift, mindset shift around uh, light technology, wearables and cobotics and other things that, uh, it, you know, I think the term automation before often meant like we need to buy like a huge robot with a big arm to do this, that or the other thing. And it's millions of dollars and you buy it and you, you know, you're going to pay it back over years. I mean, the ROI cases on some of these light technologies that we're seeing in the warehouse and the plant are, are just so strong and so fast now. And, and a lot of these things, you know, you, you look at like a logistics um, outset, or outfit and you say, well, you know, my contract for this warehouse is only a few years. And that's my horizon for ROI. Well, I mean, we can point to now technologies that, well, you know, if that customer leaves and you close that warehouse, just put all this Google Glass in a box and send it to another warehouse. And, you, you know, the, 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 the flexibility is there. And, and some of the, the, the impact, uh, you know, the use cases of some of this technology that we've seen in the field is just so powerful. So. I'm really excited about technology this year in the automation space, DC automation, manufacturing automation, wearables, cobotics, two areas that we're really focusing on and think have a lot of room to run here. Um, I could go on, but you know, <laughs> I'm conscious of my time. I, I agree. And, and, you know, I think, I think thankfully, you know, the, the surface, you know, the, the transportation space is known for a long time that it was a laggard in technological adoption. Um, and had made significant progress in adopting that technology. And over the past five to perhaps 10 years, but really the last five, there's been a significant uh, increase in technology investment, you know, allocation of capital to, to really investing in that technology to not only talk about it, not only try to do it organically, but really double down on how much technology could be built and infiltrated into the industry over as short a period of time as possible. And I think those adoption trends will accelerate. And I think a lot of the technologies you've mentioned, in addition to some that, that you hadn't yet or we haven't talked about yet, will start coming to the forefront and having a material impact on efficiency, utilization, visibility, um, effective rating, uh, a lot of different mechanisms across the space. And I think that's really exciting. Yeah, no, I agree. Um... You know, can can I look forward to the middle mile here? I know that we want to touch on all these, right? Yep. Okay. I hate. This. I don't want to take over the moderating here. <laughs> no, it's perfect. Um, so, so you know, the other thing that I think is really interesting and is really a here and now issue uh, is is the, the ocean freight market, right? I mean, how many calls do we got? Do we get? Uh, can you help us with you know very basic sort of freight forwarding as specific activities? Like, can can you help us get freight out of the port? And, you know, that's not our business. We help where we can. Um, we're a bit sort of bigger picture in that sense. But I think it's just sort of um, a symbol, a sign of the times that it, the ocean freight market is really in a, in a crisis in terms of uh, poor congestion, uh, you know, available containers, capacity levels. And, and I think, you know, as we sit back here and we're going to air this on, on March 4th, um, we'll be past Chinese New Year. I think the, the Chinese New Year is typically the reset time. And I'll tell you that if the ports can't catch up and the steamship lines can't rearrange their, their capacity and their, their vessels and get the containers back where they need in this reset period, um, this is going to be a, a, a long you know, winter here, so to speak, in terms of 
how difficult this is going to be. But typically they do, right? Typically Chinese New Year, the two weeks off is a great reset time. So I'll be interested to uh, to see how this shakes out from from the uh, container shipping market. I feel like like Punxsutawney Phil, like coming up, and am I going to see my shadow or not on, uh, you know, when this is, this airs? We'll see if the if the Chinese New Year reset happens. Um, but and this but will the, be the ultimate test for the for the reset of the Chinese New Year. And, and if and if we find ourselves really struggling to fully fully take advantage of that reset, it, it might have implications for what inventory stocking levels look like in terms of safety stock on a go forward basis. Well, I saw a stat on another, you know, our, back to our, our, our mutual friends on one of their, their market recaps with an inventory to sales ratios are at historic lows. And, you know, we saw this in 2010 when after the financial crisis, inventory to sales ratios cratered to what was then the, the historic levels. And it really precipitated uh, uh, sort of a whipsaw ocean freight market where there was a massive restocking and the carriers were short, you know, shorthanded. Um, if there continues to be a restocking effort and the containers aren't put back where they need to be over Chinese New Year, uh, we're in for more pain. And it's going to be a really painful ocean market for the year. But one thing I would say is it will write itself over time, right? In a macro sense, the, the, the container shipping market is very much set up to make sure that goods can get out of China or specifically or Asia more broadly, cost effectively and in a timely fashion. And it's not to the benefit of any of those countries and their economies and their supply chains for this market to function the way it is right now. So I have to believe that greater forces will intervene to create more container capacity, create you know more uh, available capacity in whatever means it is. But it'll just take some time to work out. So I, I again back to Punxsutawney Phil. I don't know if there's six more weeks of winter or not, but it's uh. It, there's definitely is a little bit more ahead of us, but it, it, you know, there's a few things that I would look for in terms of reading the tea leaves and how long that this will prevail. But but it's not a permanent reset in my mind. No, absolutely, that's right, that's right. And so and so stepping forward, should we talk about look forward on final mile a little bit? Yeah, I mean final mile to me, I, I think that the the challenge you know we mentioned last year um, was about you know sort of just surge in demand, right? You know anybody you know two guys in a truck, you you got it, you're in business, right? And I think what you're going to see is a lot of um, there's a lot more more pressure on the market to to you know bring out the the rate levels. Um, I think that that there's going to be I guess say that again I think there will be an easing of rate levels just based on reaching more of a steady state right a good understanding of you know how much capacity is out there what the demand is for it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw more consolidation in the space. It's a hugely fragmented market right when we talk about and we work with companies that do a lot of final mile delivery. You know, they have networks to service a national last mile delivery network. You often need 100 plus local delivery agents to cover the country. And they range from multi-billion dollar companies to, you know, Larry and Joe's moving company. So it's a, a you know, really large, just sort of fragmented and, and very diverse market. Um, I think, you know, it's been a subject of a tremendous amount of investor energy and discussion and conversation because sort of the growth trend and, and everything behind it is so compelling, but it's a hard market to make money in. Uh, and I think the last year has allowed last mile providers a sort of, uh, it, you know, the, the door open for them to, to bring up rates and to really be, you know, more aggressive in that standpoint. But I think there'll be some, it'll even out in some, some way. Um, I, I think there's also a really big, um, you know, impact that we're seeing across B2B supply chains. That's sort of the Amazon effect proliferating beyond the consumer, right? You know, you go to work and you bring your consumer expectation of service with you. And, you know, what was a, you know, three, four, five day delivery window on that part or whatever in the past now becomes a, why isn't it here today or tomorrow sort of expectation. And, you know, so I think that there's going to be more interest and more of that proliferating. But like I said, I think, you know, uh, new entrants, consolidation, you know, more Amazon activity, I think will lead to ultimately a bit more sort of rationalization of it. No, I think that's right. I think that's right. And so, you know, as you think through, you know, the the review of 2020, the look forward on 2021, as we encapsulate all of that in totality, you know, if you were sitting in front of a group of executives uh, encompassing both ocean, you know, terrestrial surface, you know, ground surface, um, and you know, and warehousing operators, what are the types of things you would be advising them to think about, and maybe some of the recommendations you'd be making? So. I'm doing all those things today. Um, you know, we have me I have meetings throughout the day with people who sort of look a lot like what you just described. So um, I'll tell you what I am doing. 
uh, you know, my advice to carriers, 3PLs, is to maintain discipline, uh, especially in you know, markets like ocean freight, where discipline has always been the, the thorn in their side, right? The chasing market share at the, at the, uh, you know, for the sake of rates or at, at the discount of rates, I should say. And, you know, I think th this opportunity right now in the ocean side, um, you know, it was clearly there's profit taking and they need to, to sort of, you know, make themselves whole. There's been a lot of really bad years and ocean freight sort of has always really been cheap, I think, in the sense, right? Um, so I, I don't think that there's any shame necessarily in in taking profits and, and sort of capitalizing on this. I do think that carriers and, and 3PLs you know, should be smart about trying to identify the companies that they want to do business with in the long term and making sure they do right by them through these these issues. Because um, I do think that there's a longevity to that. and. Um, you know, the, the business isn't, a, you know, that transactional that what you do today to sort of um, not necessarily help them out. I don't want to make it sound like there's a freebie out there because there certainly isn't. We've asked, believe me. <laughs> so, uh, but but the the um, but I think it's about, you know, there's a relationship and account building opportunity and a stickiness opportunity out there for asset based providers. Um, you know, for, for shippers, uh, I, I would caution anybody who's going into this year expecting to get a year over year decrease of their freight expenses to sort of maybe communicate something to the contrary to their management. And um, I mean, you'd really have to, you know, savings is always a function of where you're coming from, right? And in any market, there's someone who can find savings. It just means that they were really out of kilter before. So those things exist, right? Um, but by and large, in the aggregate, I don't think this is a market where shippers are going to see really a lot of, you know, price reductions or, or cost uh, deflation. In fact, I think it's quite the opposite. I think shippers really need to take a hard look at their carriers and understand who they're partnering with. And like I said, the, the inverse of what I just mentioned for carriers is sort of think about who you want to partner with and, and be strategic about it and look for some, some support from them, um, but also make sure that you don't forget it when this is over. I think the other thing shippers need to do, and you should do this all the time, it's just good hygiene, is look at the drivers of transportation. The, the best way to save money in transportation is to not ship, right? So. If you can take two trailers and make it one trailer, you're going to save a lot more than if you beat up your carriers in, a, in any market. And so I think if you can look at, you know, load consolidation opportunities, network opportunities where you could reduce miles, um, you know, all of those things, the drivers of transportation are going to help you sort of mitigate some of the costs of inflation through this environment. Uh, so there's just a few sort of thoughts around that. Investors, I think, is a wild one, too. You know, if you're an investor in this space right now, and obviously I think it really matters, it depends on what sort of segment you're in. Um, but I mean, the multiples remain high. The market's pretty hot. Um, we saw a lot of activity at the end of the last year driven by founder owned businesses looking to transact before the year. Um, we still see a lot of activity in the market. Um, so I think that, you know, it all depends always on where you bought in and, and what your multiple is. Right. Um, but I think, you know, investors more broadly should keep near to the ground for good opportunities to either find something new or get you know out of what they're in. It's a, it's a good, good market probably to transact. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. That's a great overview. I think that would be very well received advice across uh, a broad spectrum of the space. So I Thanks. think with that, Jim, I think we're gonna I think we're gonna tie this one up. It was, it was yeah. great having you on. It's good to see you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And uh, you know, it's always nice to come back home to uh, Freight Waves, former American shipper. I I, uh, I enjoy it. You guys have obviously come a really long way in the last eight years and it's great to be a part of it so thank you very much for that's me. right and we'll keep going and we'll look forward to having you know you and the team on again pretty soon yeah. appreciate it cool so with that thank you very much jim blazer director at alex partners i'm jt anxion with freight waves thank you for your time